Robin Myers is a prolific Spanish to English translator. Her latest book length translations include In Vitro by Isabel Zapata, The Book of Explanations by Teddy Lopez Mills and Copy by Dolores Dorantes. Her translations have appeared in Granta, The Baffler, Kenyan Review, The Common, Harvard Review, Two Lines, Waxwing and uh, elsewhere. A 2023 National Endowment for the Arts Translation Fellow, she was long listed twice for the 2022 National Translation Award in Poetry and among the winners of the 2019 Poems in Translation contest. Her poetry collections have been published as bilingual English-Spanish editions in Mexico, Argentina, Chile and Spain. She is an alumna of the Vermont Studio Center, the Banff Literary Translation Center and the Community of Writers. In this episode, she spoke about her work, the book Salt Crystals and various aspects of literary translation. You can buy the book Salt Crystals using the link given in the show notes. Please share your feedback on this episode either on the Spotify app or through the link provided in the show notes. You can follow Harshaniyam podcast on Spotify, Apple or search any of your favorite podcasting apps. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation Robin. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, the novel Salt Crystal is about a sense of belonging, sense of place. You lived in New York, I guess. You lived in states for some time. I was born there and I grew up in the states and I've lived outside of the United States since I finished university. I was in Mexico City for about 12 years. I'm currently in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So tell me how different is Buenos Aires for you? It's extremely different in in every sense, you know, I think um and there's an I think a parallel to be found um in 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 thinking about salt crystals too about when we talk about a language as if it were just one thing as if it were just like one language and something that the protagonist Victoria of salt crystals experiences that there are many forms of the Spanish language that are spoken and mainland Colombia and in the island of San Andres which is part of Colombia but it's culturally very different um and that's something i'm experiencing um in this shift from from Mexico City to Buenos Aires um where there the 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 textures of the spanish not just the vocabulary because of that's the easy part in a way is is the fact that you know slang changes and there are different words used for different things colloquially but it's such a different music too um and and i think there's becomes this sort of hyper awareness of your own accent and the fact that you learn to speak in a specific way with a specific community of people around you and because we are open to others and we have an ear you know the the ear starts to change and your own voice starts to change so i'm experiencing some of that um in in this move to buenos aires um and then i think also just culturally i mean there are countries with such different histories such different colonial histories to different waves of migration um so absolutely it's a it's a big it's a big adjustment but one that i'm finding really gratifying and interesting could you share your earliest encounter with books and reading i you know as a child i was a very bookish sort of shy little kid who loved to read but when i think about where that came from um i think about moments from before i knew how to read um and of being with my father who is a reader and a writer and he would sit with me and have me tell him stories and he would write them down um and then i would illustrate them and he would tell me stories too but there was something about the act of listening and dictation um that he you know very took me very seriously as a storyteller in a way that as a child you know that feels very special um and so for me i think from an early age there was a sense of connection between reading and writing and the act of sharing language now how did you get to your first book translation It was born out of a collaboration over the course of many years. I had actually studied in 
in Argentina for a little while at university and taken a poetry translation workshop, my very first, with an Argentine poet and translator named Ezequiel Seidenberg. And we became good friends after after that experience and kept in touch, and we began to translate each other. Um, and so as he was translating poems of mine, I began translating poems of his. Um, and so my very first book-length translation was, was, was his first book of poetry called, um, it's an ironic title, it's called Lyric Poetry is Dead. Um, it isn't. <laughs> and, um, and for prose, I had been in, when I moved to Mexico in 2011, I, I had be, I begun to translate as a way to make a living. I was trying to become a translator by just translating anything I could, anything, all the work I could find. And, um, and also translating literature that I loved in hopes that eventually literary translation would become a greater percentage of the work that I could do on a daily basis. And I had begun coming to contact with a Chilean writer named Monica Ramon Rios, who lives in New York. Um, and I began translating stories of hers also in as part of a, a direct collaboration with her. And that became my first prose translation. But in both cases, um, there was this, this connection with the author themselves from the beginning and this attempt to find a way um, to bring their work to an English-speaking audience together. You have published a lot of books in poetry too. You have an equally impressive portfolio in poetry as well as uh translation. How is it possible? Well, you're very kind. I do feel that there are two there are two arts and two practices that nurture and nourish each other. Um, I feel also that in this moment and in a kind of capitalist system that involves the book publication industry, we're also taught that we can sort of only be specialized in one thing. And I, I've always wanted that not to be true. I think it's, um, there are so many parts of being alive and getting involved with other people's work. And there are just so many ways that other disciplines can speak to each other, um, in whatever we end up doing. Um, I will say that, you know, while I feel that my work as a poet and my work as a translator, they're intimately connected, um, they both take up a very similar sort of obsessive focus and a lot of hours sitting by yourself <laughs> in, in a room. Um, and I often do struggle to balance them. Um, I always wish I were writing more than I am. Um, I think because translation is also... That there, I love the collaborative aspect of it. Um, it's a kind of work that also immediately involves um, relationships of trust and responsibility to other people and with other people. And I take that very seriously. And it's also how I pay my rent. And so it's also, it's often easier for me to put that first. <laughs> um, and at the end of the day, if I've spent, you know, the entire working week translating, um, I often don't have the sort of energy that I wish I had. Um, to devote to my own writing. So I'm always trying to experiment with that balance, but I've also come to accept that the relationship between writing and translating, it doesn't have to be 50-50. It doesn't have to be consistent all the time. I do increasingly believe that whatever I'm translating and feeling excited by and learning from as a translator, that's going to find its way into what I'm thinking about and trying to write somehow at some point. And I don't try to control that too much. Um, and I also try to allow, if I'm in a period of time where I'm very, very busy translating, I'm not writing very much, that's okay. And to trust that eventually it will come back, something will open up. Um, and then I'll get to sort of explore what has happened since the last time I was more immersed in my own writing. So yeah, trying to just trust that that, that conversation is happening in underground. I came to translation through poetry, really, and that as a, a young reader and writer, I, I was captivated by poetry. That's what I read most. That's what I wanted to write. Um, and I was also on this sort of personal journey, for lack of a better word, with the Spanish language, where I, I, was, I wanted very much to live in Mexico. There's part of my family that came from Mexico. Um, and I wanted to learn Spanish so that I could be in Mexico. It was less of a literary goal or a professional goal. It was about wanting to be in a very specific place. Um, and so as I learned Spanish and as I continued to study and read, 
Um, and then I had this experience in, in, in Buenos Aires as a sort of detour at that point where I studied for a semester and took this translation workshop. Um, it just became the union of these two things of, of you know, I, I didn't really intend to become a translator. Um, and I had, in fact, when I started to translate a very romantic idea of what translation was, I thought it was this sort of you were in communion with this text and you were interpreting it. And I didn't know very much or had thought very much about just the craft of translation um but it became i don't know i think if you're uh if you're an obsessive sort of reader if you really like um getting your hands dirty and just how a text works how image what images do um if you don't mind reading things over and over and over and over again if you like revising um translation is a, is an actually quite a natural progression um of those interests to begin and, and thinking about other experiences as a reader and as a writer, you know, you're you're never alone. I mean, maybe you're never alone at all. Like the idea of the solitary writer is also a myth, but there's something about that sort of 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 connection and of exploration also. And as a translator, you end up having to learn. You become a, a sort of a researcher to into this particular author and their world and what they're writing about. You know, this this other myth about translation that in order to translate, you need to be some sort of expert in the language you're translating from. And what really happens, I think, is that you become a perpetual student of the language you're translating into. You're learning all the time about the language, you're, whether it's your mother tongue or another language, but you're, you're, always, you're always going deeper into it. Being a poet, does it influence the kind of prose that you choose to translate Absolutely. Um, with the prose that I seek out and choose to translate, because sometimes I also trans books, translate books that I've been commissioned, um, you know, when it comes to obviously every book is its own world and, and, and a book that I love will involve all sorts of reasons why I love it. But as a translator of prose, what I'm drawn to is prose where, where where the engine is the language. Um, I'm much less interested in plot um, in general. And um, I think I'm I find myself as a reader um, captivated by novels and short stories where there is a sense of where where there is a material attention to, to language, which is something that is, you know, poetry is is that's what it's made of, is the language doing what it says. Um, so I'm absolutely more most interested, both as a as a translator and just as a reader, as someone looking for prose to read, um, that is springs forth from from the language more than from anything else. One of the books that you have translated, the forgery, you collaborated with Ellen Jones. Yes. Tell us about the experience of collaboration. In what ways you collaborate? It was a wonderful experience. It was the first time I had co-translated um, at all, and and certainly an, an entire novel. And it was the first time for Ellen too. We, Ellen is a British translator living in Mexico City as well, and we had met through mutual friends. We didn't know each other very well, and we had realized that we were we had become interested in the same author um, in in Ave Barrera, who has published two novels at this point. This is her first. Um, and so we decided when Charco Press in the UK became interested in publishing it that we could work together on the translation. What we ended up doing, and this was also made easier by the structure of the book, which we realized um, when we set about trying to divide up the book or figure out how to collaborate, um, it's, it was written in equal, equal basically in two sections of almost equal length um, and in chapters that um, we alternated chapters, basically. So these two halves of the book, we would each start with alternating chapters, do a first pass on the translation, and then swap and comment on each other's work, make adjustments, ask each other questions, then swap again, then swap again, then swap again, until it became almost impossible for both of us to remember which we had translated first. Um, and I think it's also a, a lovely metaphor for the kind of... of of conversation, you know, translation muddies the waters in really exciting ways. Is this, I think there's this idea, you know, of the author of a book and, you know, the sense of ownership and individual insight, inspiration and translation is, it does something else. It complicates that narrative. 
Um, so that was really fun um, and and surprising to see how 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 over the course of many rounds of this, um, how we both became so enmeshed in each other's work. And in that sense, you know, I think there were two, a couple of things going on there. And if, you know, you're, you, we were also, you know, I'm from the United States. Ellen is from the UK. Our English is very different. Um, and Charco Press is based in the UK, but distributes in the US. And so um, it was amazing to see how different our, our instincts were in many cases. And we weren't trying to homogenize the English. It wasn't about, I think, you know, the idea of, of any language being neutral is impossible. It's false. And that's not something I aspire to or I'm interested in. But in order for the voice to feel cohesive, we had to translate each other <laughs> also and translate ourselves. So I, I talk about it as kind of a translation and a half. Now, would you be doing uh, more of that in the future or how is it? Ellen and I are are beginning on the next few months. Um, we'll hopefully be working together on Ave's second book. Um, and at the same time, um, I also was working on a co-translation with a wonderful U.S.-based translator named Sarah Booker on a novel by the Mexican writer Cristina Rivera Garza. Um, and so, and that was also that's been a really thrilling experience too, and a very wild experimental novel that involves poetry and academic article and narrative prose, all sorts of different kinds of language. And I guess I'd also I meant to say when you asked about collaborative translation in general that it's also just such a relief to work with someone else. I think you know as a translator, there's so many decisions tiny, tiny, tiny decisions all the time that you have to make. And that's what it's about. And that's part of what I love about translation. But sometimes it's just, it feels great to have someone else to discuss those things with and to make decisions together, uh, to share that sense of accountability, to share those doubts and uncertainties. Ellen and I, when we finished, we both said to each other, maybe we'll just never translate anything alone ever again. You said you have also done some commissioned translation. Now, have you ever found yourself at odds with the author's intended message and how did you resolve it? Hmm. It's a really, I, I really appreciate this question in, and this is a digression of, of my own, but I think as translation becomes more recognized as an art, which I think is, of course, long overdue, absolutely essential, um, there's also an, a side effect, I think, which is that in, in recognizing translators as artists, which they are, um, there isn't as much discussion of translation as labor also. Um, and, and, and as it's, it's also work and work involves rights and, and conditions and, and all sorts of other factors, you know, as, as should be the case for any profession, any trade. Um, so I think you know, it's it's often interesting and difficult to talk about both as a translator, sort of expected to be a kind of ambassador for everything you translate, as if you equally love everything you translate, which, to be honest, may not be the case. And maybe, you know, there you have an experience of admiration and respect for most things you translate, but not necessarily a sense of affinity or identification or even endorsement of everything you translate. Um, I haven't experienced, I think the only time I was asked to translate something that I felt just so ideologically at odds with um, that it caused me a sense of personal conflict. I just chose not to translate it. Like it felt, you know, that there was just not, not a road I wanted to take. Um, but there are certainly other instances, like I'm thinking about a series of essays that I translated by a writer I love, I think is absolutely fantastic. Um, but there's one essay that comes to mind, which is very critical of, of the sort of spectacle of protest. Um, which I also f find problematic. I think that, you know, the sort of the right to protest and in the world we live in, you know, thinking about lots of things that are happening right this minute. Um, like I personally would not write an essay sort of like, I'm not sure about this whole protest business, you know, and yet she's such an interesting and self-critical writer that I think there is a lot about her essay that even if I didn't personally agree with her conclusion, that she's still taking a lot of ideas into herself and questioning them. Um, and I, and I appreciate that and I respect it. Um, there are other cases where I think, you know, there I'm thinking about specific images that have come up in various texts I'm writing where I think, 
are are potentially offensive and i if i have the the opportunity to talk with the writer i will say so is you know because i think translation is also an opportunity um to think about audience to think about reception of a text and it's not about you know and i i i just to you know modify my not modify but modulate my own response i'm also not of the mind that you have to sanitize everything about literature it's not about making everybody happy or comfortable but i think it's also useful to talk with authors and to talk among translators and readers um about what what the intended effect is of of a text or of an idea or an image and sometimes in discussing with the writer hey you know i think this metaphor it sounds a little bit racist or it sounds a little bit sexist or like i'm not sure if this is your intent at all and i'm letting you know as somebody who cares about your work and about your text and about your readers that is this what you had in mind and maybe they'll say oh no actually not at all that's not what i wanted to do at all and sometimes they'll change it um so i think you know it becomes a conversation in that sense too about you know an interrogation of intent and and if an effectiveness um and that also doesn't mean that i'm going to you know to 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 refuse to translate something because i i don't personally agree with it i just think that every translator has their own set of 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 criteria of principles um and it, it's a it's a personal set of decisions about what feels possible and appropriate and desirable to associate yourself with um and and those decisions i think change for people all the time i know they've changed for me over time um but i think it's the translator is a really interesting often somewhat uncomfortable role in the conversation around a book because it's um because often it's not it doesn't end with the book it's off you know then you often have to you know you appear in events and you have you give talks and um and so i think it's also interesting for there to be a conversation internally about you know is this how can i how do i position myself in relation to something that i may respect but don't identify with or something that yeah i think there are lots of questions um that come up in all sorts of different ways once you commit to a translation project uh, could you outline the step by step process to bring the work to life in its translated form sure well i tend to be very i my first drafts tend to be very rough um i this applies to my process as a writer also i find it much easier to really do the work once something exists on the page um and so i know translators who are very very meticulous about every line in a first draft and they work slowly and i'm the opposite i'd say that i tend to um to sort of give myself over to a first draft um and because i'm usually working on multiple books at the same time um i pretty early on in a project will develop a sense of you know literally how many pages do i need to translate a day in order to reach a deadline and so i will break it up um in order to be able to do multiple things at the same time um and once i've come to the end of a first draft whether that's a single poem or an entire novel um then i'll go back and and re- and read it over in a much more meticulous way um make lots of of adjustments um respond to questions i've asked myself in the margins notes i've made to myself um and then i'll usually do that again um both as an independent read of the translation as it exists as it stands on its own um and then in dialogue with the original text as well to make sure you know um yeah to make sure that i haven't missed things that are important that i haven't misread which is in it's inevitable that that happens in in different points across the or along the way um and so i'd say that there's you know there's a kind of a process of zooming in um that happens for me throughout the revision um that the first cut is very rough and then it gets more and more um obsessive and detail oriented as i go um and that can it depends on the book but there are often many many versions um of a translation before before i will share it with the author if the author is interested in being part of the process if they have a working relationship with the english language and and are both able and interested in reading the translation um it's usually once 
the translation is 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 heavily revised that then I will share it with the author and ask them questions I have because I always have questions and I'll and invite them also to ask me questions or to make corrections or requests um, and I really enjoy that part also when it becomes more of a conversation um, and then there's another revision after that or two um, and then I will I will submit it to the publishing house the editor and uh, what kind of editing gets done at the publishing house? I have found that it varies enormously. And um, I think some of the most involved editing process I've experienced have been, um, this I don't think is surprising at all, but with editors who speak Spanish as well. Um, and so editors who are, you know, who are making suggestions and, and reading with as as translators in a way, you know that they're in contact with the original text too, um, and that's happened to me on several poetry projects and at a press like like Charco also, where um, both the the editors and the copy editors are are bilingual Spanish English speakers and translators themselves in most cases. Um, and there are other presses where it's mostly line editing, you know, where it's um, and without necessarily any contact of uh, with the with the original text, which is also a really interesting shift for the role of the editor, um, because I think most editors are in the position of requesting or suggesting changes to whatever is considered the original text, um, and with a translation. Um, that isn't necessarily going to happen, or there's more of a more of a passive role for many editors about you know well you know I'm assuming that this you you did this for a reason because there's this original text that I can't read, <laughs> um, and so some editors I think request changes without you know with, with with without having the original in mind, and then it falls to the translator to negotiate those changes about you know okay there's an image that's extremely ambiguous um, is that because there is something very important about that ambiguity in the original text that needs to be protected but perhaps in a in a better way um, or is it something that just isn't working in the translation and needs to be fine-tuned um, and those are questions that I think often arise most um, in the editing process with an editor regardless of whether or not they read the source language. How do you perceive the current state of translations from Latin America in mainstream English publishing? And uh, do you think uh, they are adequately represented? And speaking from the U.S. experience mostly, the amount of literature published in the United States that is literature in translation is tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny. This, the, the rate, the percentage, which is most often quoted, which I think has risen a little bit in the last couple of years, but even so is 3% of everything published. So, you know, we're already talking about a literary market with very little interest um, in what is being written in other languages, in other parts of the world, period. Um, and of that tiny percentage of literature and translation, there are certain languages, unsurprisingly, that take up much more space, um, that are much more often translated, which are Spanish, French, um, I don't know if German, Russian, um, and and there are, I think, exciting changes and expansions in, in, in literature and translation and, and what it's representing, what it's encompassing. Um, but it's been interesting for me in, in kind of coming of age as a translator, um, just to, to understand also that Spanish is among the most represented um, languages in translation. And yet within the, the body of work being published in English translation from Latin America, um, there are countries that are far more represented than others. Um, you know, Argentina is one, Mexico is another. Um, there are, you know, so many countries in the vast, incredibly diverse region that is Latin America that have very little representation at all. I'm thinking of Paraguay or Bolivia, um, Peru, um, Central America, you know, most countries that represent Central America. Um, so there are you know, these enormous inequalities in, in representation, sort of in all of these concentric circles when we talk about literature and translation. So that's something that I've certainly observed. Um, I think there are there are trends um, to be observed, and I'm also, though, wary often of 
talking of, of, of kind of falling into the trap of representation and that, you know, if there is an, a country that has, you know, two books that became runaway bestsellers in the U.S. as if those two books are then put in the position of speaking for an entire nation <laughs> and its literature. Um, and so I never want to do that as a translator and always want to think about what does manage to become translated and published um, as always a, a tiny, a tiny fraction. Um, and and that often you know comes from the, that that it, that involves also the publishing apparatus in the country of origin of you know what managed to get published to begin with um, in Mexico or in Argentina or in Colombia or wherever. Um, I think though we can see is in recent years um, an enormous amount of incredibly exciting experimental fiction written by women in Latin America um, from across different countries. Um, I remember reading some articles in the last few years, also a phrase that I think is overly generalized, but still interesting about the kind of Latin American Gothic um, a, a trends in different literatures, plural in Latin America, um, that have a sense of the, the uncanny and the sort of sinister exploration of legacies of violence. Um, in both rural and urban Latin America. I think that's often a tension that we can see in a lot of literature coming out of Latin America. Um, and yeah, I think an, an enormous preoccupation with both past and present violence and inequality um, in Latin America. Um, and I think also a, a, a lot of writers who are working to get out from under the perception um, of other trends that, you know, thinking about once Gabriel Garcia Marquez became famous with 100 Years of Solitude and the English language publishing world started talking about magical realism, there's this now this expectation that everybody, <laughs> everybody who does anything that is strays from the realist confines is magical realist, which is absolutely not true. And there's, you know, a huge misunderstanding of what magical realism is. So I think also this sense of, of trying to grapple with influence and and being pigeonholed um, and reduced to to these very dynamics of representation you know the U.S. decides that you know so and so is Bolaño or you know the next Bolaño or the next Garcia Marquez maybe with the writer who doesn't feel that they have been influenced at all you know um, so I, I find that really fascinating is watching younger generations of writers say like actually no <laughs> What is the role of the indie presses in this? Absolutely essential. Absolutely essential doing the work. And I would say this is the case of, you know, in everywhere, not just in translation, but I think the kind of um, of courage and curiosity and support um, that indie publishers provide in 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 finding ways and still, I think, just heroically difficult, you know, to find ways to publish literature that isn't going to make that aren't going to fly off the shelves. They're not going to sell millions of copies, um, but that are are constantly enriching and changing and diversifying um, the what what is being written, what is in conversation with each other. Um, I think about you know this as something that's really ex one of the few things I think is exciting to me and promising and hopeful about the the English language publishing world, which can be so insular and so navel gazing and so narcissistic, um, is that there in the last not very many years, there are many, many more um, indie publishers that are either focused entirely on literary translation or are or aren't, and yet are expanding to include translation. I find both of those things actually equally exciting. It makes me just as happy to hear about a new press that's only publishing translation as about a press that was not interested in publishing translation at all and is starting to do so. I think that's also a very good sign. Um, and ultimately, I think that a publishing industry is an ecosystem. You know, it's it's not about and I think this is part of what's so harmful about the monopolies of the huge commercial presses um, is that they sort of suck up all the life and resources out of an ecosystem that needs all sorts of different kinds of life to survive. Um, and so the, the more, the better. In the case of Latin American literature, Charco Press, the kind of work that they are doing is amazing. 
They are. It's an incredible catalog, um, an amazing range, um, and yes, definitely responding to an appetite um, for really exciting a broad range of literature coming out of Latin America. Coffee House Press is the other indie publisher. I think In Vitro is uh, published by. Exactly. In Vitro is, yes, came out with Coffee House Press, um, which publishes both literature and tra in translation and books pub written initially in English. Mm -hmm. um, and another indie press that has, that was, I think, one of the forerunners, you know, one of the pioneers um, of advocacy for translation and in the, in the U.S. market is open letter books. Um, and um, and they're often they work increasingly in collaboration with Dalkey Archive, which is an older press, and with Deep Bellum, which is a new press. Also, yeah, and they're doing a lot of really exciting work in in in, in cahoots with each other. Now we will talk about uh, salt crystals. Mm. This uh, novel unfolds on the island of uh, San Andres. Mm -hmm. uh, could you provide some historical context and uh, elaborate on the island's significance in author's life to Christina Bendek? Yes. San Andres is an island in Caribbean Colombia, um, and it has a complex history of, of colonialism and migrations. Um, it was occupied first by British settlers um, and then by Spanish colonists um, and and has an indigenous Afro-Caribbean population called the Raizales, um, of which Cristina Bendik has, has Raizal um, ancestry. And it's both a culturally and a linguistically very complex place. Um, there is Spanish spoken on the island, also a form of uh, the islands in this archipelago, San Andres and Providencia. And so there's a form of English Creole spoken there as well. Um, and it's also um, a, a tourist destination. And so it's, you know, a place that lots of, of tourists, both from mainland Colombia and from elsewhere, from the U.S., from Europe, from lots of places, go to vacation because the beaches are beautiful. Um, and like most places that become a tourist destination that has experienced economic exploitation, um, ecological destruction, um, exploitation at the hands of governments, various governments. Um, there's also, you know, a sense of tension culturally with mainland Colombia, which, you know, has a sense of, of, of prominence in the national and international imaginary that San Andres, um, which has such a different history, um, does not. Um, and so the, the, the character, uh, the main character, Victoria, um, who is from San Andres, she, her, her parents have died. She has come back from living several years in Mexico City, and she decides to return to San Andres to sort of take charge of the house that her parents left her and also figure out what to do with herself and reconnect um, with her home after many years away. Um, and what I think is, is also so intelligent and interesting about the novel is that it becomes a way for her to grapple both with her sense of belonging culturally to the Raizal community, um, but also to grapple with the own horrific legacies of, of, you know, she learns at a certain point in the book that her own ancestors who were Irish immigrants own slaves. Um, and so as someone who descends both from the oppressed and the oppressors, um, in a way that I think also even if the, the specific context of San Andres is very specific, um, that in itself is an experience shared by so many people across Latin America. Um, and as you say, it's, it has a, a stream of consciousness feel to it, but there's also an enormous amount of information. Like it's a book that, um, that includes a lot of historical background. The reader, you know, s gradually learns about the history of San Andres as the, the main character herself does. Um, and yet there are also these passages, which are the, some of the ones that I most enjoyed translating where she, they're, they're almost ecstatic. Like, and that often has to do with her contact with, with nature that she's swimming or she's, um, you know, in, in, She's having having an experience of the physical landscape um, where she is sort of swept. The prose itself is swept along. The punctuation changes. There are lots of commas. Um, it's it becomes sort of rich and undulating and beautiful um, in a way that I really loved working on.
throughout the novel author talks about her loss of identity failed relations with the land and other people but i thought uh, um, when she starts discussing about san andres right yeah. the place i thought actually the narrator's life is actually a metaphor for what san andres is going through absolutely mm-hmm. that she has done it wonderfully well mm-hmm. the architecture is very complex and and subtle yeah mm-hmm. there are some small details uh, you know inter- interspersed throughout the novel mm-hmm. she talks about frigate birds mhm frigate birds uh, they migrate thousands of miles mhm and uh, while they are migrating they sleep <laughs> i love that <laughs> Yeah, and maybe I mean I I haven't asked her about the frigate birds, but I imagine that they they really are. I mean, they're just part of of the landscape and so they ended up in the book, but but yes, it takes on this whole other symbolic meaning. Mm-hmm. This is an intimately personal work by the author. In such cases, do you think it's really crucial for the translator to keep the communication going on with the author? is it required it is not required i feel categorically that it's not required and that ultimately the relationship when it for of uh, between the translator and the text is the key relationship whatever happens between what is inside already what's what's there in the book um and the translator um that is the primary conversation i think you know and and this is just goes without saying but you know there are so many historical works or or books that were you know written by someone who's been dead for 500 years or 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 2 years you know that the translator does not ever have the option um of of consulting the author on anything um or having a conversation about the weather or what have you that just isn't going to happen and that doesn't mean that their translations aren't extraordinary and attentive and carefully researched and um and take on the life of their own i think i think it i i feel very strongly that a conversation with the author isn't required but it is much more fun often <laughs> um and i think it i have i i would also be lying if i said i hadn't found it enormously enriching and informative and helpful and reassuring to be able to talk with the author and Cristina who's an absolutely delightful person um was so generous with her time this i think was it also a challenge for me in that well i you know i i've translated books written in places that i that i don't know as that i know more or less about this was a very very new context for me um and i had to do a lot of reading and research on my own but there were things also both on the level of you know language but also just information that i wanted to make sure i was understanding properly that i was contextualizing properly and so i was doing my own homework um but it was great you know to be able to check with christina um and and something that i think the the translation enormously enormously benefited from um my conversation with her but if i hadn't been able to talk with her if she wasn't interested you know in in talking with me or if she were unavailable um i would have had to deal with it myself <laughs> you know and become accountable you know which isn't to say that i would have or that i have in fact gotten everything you know quote unquote right um but i would have had to um to do to go through a process in a different way in order to come up with a translation that i felt was being attentive to all of the details that needed being attentive to and to do the very best i could um to learn what i had to learn um but ultimately i think that's 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 always the case whether or not you get to talk with the writer uh can you recount any specific uh, cases where her inputs have really you know enhanced the translation There's so many. I'm trying it's always hard to come up with one on the spot. Um this is this is not a, about a piece of information but about a tone um a tonal decision. The very last sentence of this book um which is a single word in Spanish which is deliramos and the verb delirar um is sort of to be it can be described as as to be as to be delirious as to be in a sort of a delirious fever to be confused to be disoriented to be ranting to be in a sort of transportative state um 
but where it appears um, at this point of the text is in the middle of a hurricane and in the middle of, a, of an experience of falling in love, of a sort of romantic ecstasy in the middle of a, of a destructive natural, disa- natural disaster. Um, and, and there's something very powerful about the plural. You know, it's, it's deliramos means we. It's the, you know, it's the, the, the suffix of, of, the, of the plural we. Um, and I went around and around and around about, you know, the, the, it's the last word in the whole book. It's very important. It needs to have, you know, it needs to be light, but it needs to have weight at the same time. And Christina and I went back and forth a lot. And eventually we settled on the solution. We rave, you know, and in English rave um, can both be, you know, ranting and raving, but also the sense of, of being in a sort of ecstatic trance. Um, and, and it's neat and tidy. It's brief, but that was something that just because we were already in conversation, um, that I, you know, we, we got to just have a conversation about is, like, oh, how, you know, and, and she, she also was, she was, you know, incredibly sympathetic to the challenge of that particular, of that particular phrase. Um, and of course it was important to both of us, um, that it feel right. Um, so that's a specific example, but I'll also, you know, this is one, um, this is more of a back and forth in the other direction. It's not an experience I had, but I'm thinking about a friend of mine who's a translator from Spanish as well. And in the book she was translating, there was a recipe or somebody was making a cake um, and she was a very good baker and realized that there was absolutely no way that the recipe <laughs> itself, <laughs> that was not going to work. Um, and so, and you know, and so that was obviously, she talked about it with the author and they fixed it and they came up with the proportions that were, <laughs> but I think, you know, that's, that, it's a different sort of, of experience, but um, again, a, a moment of, of exchange between writer and translator that involves research, you know, that involves actual factual knowledge rather than just how does this sound, you know. What kind of advice would you offer to aspiring translators? I guess I would say that, first of all, um, translation is, is, a, is a joyful and often disruptive act in a joyful way and language is meant to be played with it is a it is language is also is not just um a sort of solemn entity to be revered um but also a physical material to be explored and played with um we talked earlier about the fact that um that translation is an experience of always learning more about your own language. Um, and I would say that too is, um, as, as just not, it's, that's not exactly advice, but just as something to always remember that it's none of this is about mastery of anything. Um, it's about a really deep, extremely rigorous exploration and experience of curiosity. Um, and coming from the background I come from, which is, you know, a monolingual, um, cultural context in the United States, um, realizing that, you know, there are so many people on planet earth whose experience of being alive is multilingual, you know, that, that, that so many humans, you know, we have an experience of, of bi or multilingualism that changes our relationship with our own identities and with what we read and who, how we feel we have the right to express ourselves. Um, and that, Translation is a way of getting to have a relationship with at least two languages, um, and of and that's something that can accompany you forever, um, and that will keep changing forever. On a practical level, because all of that is very abstract, I would say that there is probably nothing that has been more helpful and um, transformative for me as a translator than in developing relationships with other translators, um, because it is a strange, um, small, often overlooked, hard to explain role. Um, and, you know, you're involved with writers, but you're also with editors and agents sometimes. And I think um, having a community of people who translate is, is an incredible gift. And it's also um, both, both psychologically, emotionally, and also professionally, it's, it's really important to have people to share questions with, um, to help each other figure things out. Um, I think the road to translating and then publishing a translation is very confusing. Um, 
And so being proactive and seeking out other translators and seeking out translators who to be, to mentor you, you know, um, people who are willing to be generous with what they've learned. I was lucky enough to have people in my life um, who were willing to, to talk me through things. And it's something that I, as I've been doing this for not very many years, but enough years to start to be experiencing mentoring and being mentored. Um, so I would say that just find those translators, find your people. And they're often <laughs> much easier and more fun to be around than writers. Please read a paragraph from uh, Salt Crystals that uh, you found uh, particularly gratifying after the translation, both in English and Spanish versions. Okay, so here's, I'm going to read a passage from Salt Crystals that's one of those more es ecstatic stream of consciousness passages I mentioned, uh, where the the protagonist, Victoria, has gone to swim in the ocean for the first time since she returned to the island of San Andres. So here's a bit in Spanish. El agua está fría. Entro de a poquitos para disfrutar una inundación de mi alimento. Doy un par de brazadas, aspiro hondo y me sumerjo un metro, dos, tres. El mar me ha llenado ya los oídos. Escucho como si dos cables se hubieran encajado en la cabeza. El sol pinta haces luminosos alrededor de mí, con colorcitos rosados y lilas. Veo un pez huir asustado. Me quedo en el fondo un momento. El ruido que se oye está en mis oídos, un zumbido tenue que aumenta con el más leve movimiento, un burbujeo. Me quedo quieta. Tengo aire aún. Podría llorar ahora. Así debí sentirme en el vientre, en un líquido amniótico como este, de donde nacieron todas mis posibilidades. And now I'll read that same passage and a bit more in English. The water is cold. I make my way in gradually, letting myself be flooded with my element. I swim a couple of strokes, take a deep breath and plunge under one meter, two, three. My ears are full of sea already. I can hear as if my head's been rewired. All around me, the sun paints luminous shafts streaked with pink and lilac. A startled fish darts away. I linger down below for a moment. The noise lives in my ears, a faint hum that intensifies with the slightest movement, a bubbling. I hover, motionless. I've still got air. I could cry right now. This is how I must have felt in utero, in an amniotic liquid just like this, where all my possibilities were birthed. And I really was born here, I think proudly. I uncross my legs and kick down hard to the sandy bottom. I let my body sway with the friction as I rise. I burst to the surface and release my air, take another mouthful. My heart is racing. I suddenly think of evangelical baptisms. They're conducted here on this very beach in the water, a ritual of welcome. No, it's not the sea of travel magazines. It's not a holiday. It's a confinement or an embrace, both at once. Thank you, Robin, for such a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you. It's been such such a pleasure, truly. I'm so I'm so glad to have gotten to have this conversation. <laughs>